this whole phenomenon of the Twitter files and everything is only possible because Elon bought Twitter. Uh, Elon bought Twitter, and and I think this is this was because uh, of, a, of a number of things. The Babylon B, um, where you know Seth Dillon. Do you ever see the Babylon B stuff? I do. They're great. I mean, they're doing really fun stuff. Babylon B guys are doing a great job. Um, Seth got locked out of his Twitter account, and he and Elon know each other. And he's just like, "What do you mean?" And it was over. Rachel Levine as man of the year was basically the tweet. And Rachel Levine, as you know, is a transgender man who was uh, like an admiral in HHS or something, I forget, you know, Health and Human Services, and had been called woman of the year, which should be an insult to any person who lives in reality because this is neither a woman nor the woman of the year. But he got locked out of his Twitter account because of that, okay? So for the objective, and, and I think this is important to what we're saying about how they're liars, for the objective statement of fact, Twitter Destroyed his, destroyed his account, locked him out forever. And for different uh, media entities, uh, you know, commentators, that can really hurt your business. I mean, there, there's real consequences to this. It's not just like, oh, well, now I can't, you know, post on the local message board or something. It really matters. It's meaningful. So that then also brings, the, brings me back to the, um, the whole era of the deplatforming that occurred right around the 2020 election, and you had the uh, four, uh, 51, was it 50? I keep forgetting, it's 51, right? Former intelligence officials who signed something that they had to know was false and moronic. They hadn't seen the laptop data. I knew people who had mirrored it and were offered it to CNN, offered it, said, hey guys, here we go. Dive through it, find me the Russian disinformation in here. And also think about what a, if the story wasn't true, uh, leaving the laptop at the, and, and you know, Hunter Biden's a guy's a, he's a, a you know, crackhead and he's a total mess. I mean, the notion of him forgetting a laptop somewhere and never picking it up is completely credible. Um, Let's talk about what was on that laptop. First. Sure. Uh, I mean, Hunter Biden. So there's the there's the salacious stuff that has made its way into the realm of the you know New York Post front page and all this sort of stuff and then um, and th th to be clear there's people over there who've done great reporting on it Miranda Devine has done awesome reporting on it and she they, they were right they were right on the Hunter Biden laptop and deserve a tremendous amount of credit but I think that because the salacious stuff just sticks in the mind more you know Hunter wearing a a boa in his tidy whiteies with a couple of hookers, you know, I mean, you've, you've seen this stuff too. It's just, I mean, the guy's really depraved. I mean, he's a person who's really um, in need of, of, of serious assistance. And there's the part of it that we're just saying, there's just that interest in someone who's in the state of collapse, I think, or who is uh, a public figure that has messed up his life so much. But then there's the important stuff, which I think is what, you know, you're alluding to, which is where was Hunter getting his money from? Mm -hmm. Right. Do you Wait. think all this stuff was a cover up for that? They wanted to bring kind of the sexual, the sexual, whatever you want to call it, the sexual stuff up to kind of breeze over the, the important stuff in the media? Uh, I think it's a challenge because even people who want the real story of Hunter Biden and, and really the, the, the corruption that the Democrat Party completely allows and encourages at the very highest level, whether it was the Clinton Foundation, which was clearly a pay for pay, uh, pay for play scheme. I'm on record. I mean, when I was uh, trying to, you know, fight commies over at CNN on the air, I mean, I would say, you know, what, because they would talk about the Clinton Foundation. They would say, well, it's a charity. And I said, well, it's not really, a I mean, when you're getting paid $800,000 a speech and flying around the world on private jets, like you're not really operating a charity, right? Bill Clinton made 800 grand from, I think it was a Russian back bank was the most he ever got paid for one speech. Um, they were clearly peddling influence, at least, the, at least the belief in the people writing the checks that they were selling influence. And I said, well, what if I, what if I'm in an elected office? I used to say this on the air. And uh, my wife were, um, were a, all of a sudden a painter. And I'm not taking any money from anybody, but she's selling paintings for a million dollars a piece. That's what the market will bear. That's what, they go into her gallery, they pay her a million dollars. Would that raise any eyebrows for anybody? Because that's effectively what the Clinton found. Hunter Biden's doing that. 
And they won't disclose who's buying these paintings. I mean, think about that for a moment. It, you come up with a theoretical to show how crazy, how dishonest, and how cynical all of this is. And it's just a matter of time before they actually do the thing that you're using as the example of how corrupt and dishonest they are. So he is making these finger paintings or whatever they are for $50,000 each. Everyone can check that. That's real. The, pre the sitting president's son is doing that. But on the point of where he got his money from and what's on the Hunter Biden laptop, um, he wasn't getting paid by the Swiss. He wasn't getting checks from you know, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Thailand or something. I mean, you know, maybe that would raise some eyebrows too. I don't know. He was getting it from China and Ukraine. He was getting it from our biggest adversary and he was getting it from a country where his dad, as vice president, was specifically head of the foreign policy portfolio for the Obama administration in that country at a time when that country was on the brink as it was and USAID and support was basically live or die and Joe Biden is on video bragging about how he fired the chief corruption prosecutor in that country. Th like, the worst, this is what we'll talk about this with Epstein too. There are conspiracy theorists and there are coincidence theorists, right? Everything is a coincidence. Mm -hmm. And everything with Hunter Biden, Hunter Biden and his dad is supposed to be just a coincidence. This is where the money comes from. This is how it's being handled. This is what's going on. How did the FBI get involved in all this? So one thing that I think everybody has to start to get acclimated to or aware of, better way of saying it, is the uh, counterterrorism apparatus that you and I were familiar with um, back in the day of the GWAT, right, the Global War on Terror, and the the government agencies with all of their resources and all their personnel who are trying to find ways uh, to justify their, their day to day, particularly on the, you know, the civilian intel agency side, that hasn't gone away. And a lot of the language, a lot of the uh, bureaucratic approach that was used in the global war on terror to deal with, you know, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, go down the list, all these different groups, you're noticing that there are domestic, there are domestic focuses now from FBI and all the rest of them that mirror the language, the surveillance tactics, the, even the, some of the threat level and concern. I mean, somehow we have transitioned from we're all on the same page as a country that, you know, bin Laden and Al-Qaeda are a mortal threat and are avowed enemies, and we got to just put aside some of the political stuff for a while we take care of them. You fast forward 20 years, what does the counterterrorism apparatus of the United States government say is the biggest threat to this country right now? Hey everybody, I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.